to be hearing those African voices. And, and often we have other people that are speaking uh, on behalf of, uh, of Africans. So the whole idea is that how do we create the space for local communities, small scale farmers, indigenous people, uh, in order for them to, to raise the, the key issues uh, around sustainable use. And realizing that in order for us to have sustainable use, we have to conserve uh, our biodiversity, but also there needs to be uh, fair and equitable uh, benefit sharing. The network uh, also serves as a platform for us to exchange knowledge because we are bringing together a diversity of, of members working from different parts of the continent, but also working on different issues. So bringing these members together, it really creates a, uh, a platform for the exchange of knowledge, uh, lessons and experiences. And we see this as really one of the strengths uh, of this uh, network. The network is, is hosted and supported by the African Wildlife Foundation. Um, and in our uh, experience with these networks is that, you know, when you begin these networks, they do need um, either one of the members or another body that provides the support for, for the network to, um, to flourish. Um, we also, um, and this is very interesting about networks, uh, is that members uh, of ACBA are also members of other networks. So for example, the, the CBD Alliance, which is uh, an alliance of civil society organizations across the world, from the global south and the global north, and includes other regions, Latin America uh, uh, and Asia. So we are a member of the CBD Alliance, and we see that being a member of the CBD Alliance also gives us uh, uh, access to other platforms to be able to influence and to engage, especially at the negotiations that are taking place uh, and leading up to COP15. We also have a very strong partnership with the Chinese Civil Society Alliance for Biodiversity Conservation. Um, and we felt this is really good for us to be able to understand how uh, the colleagues in China, especially uh, since China is the, uh, the presidency uh, of the COP, um, how they deal with the issues of uh, sustainable use and what lessons uh, we can learn from them. And we've held several um, webinars with them around this, uh, this broad topic of sustainable use, uh, financing for biodiversity, and the threats uh, to, to biodiversity. So it's been a fairly productive um, uh, uh, collaboration with, with the Chinese. And then the other one is the Community Leaders uh, Network, which is mainly organized around uh, Southern Africa um, and looking at issues of CBNRM. So we are also uh, a member and we engage and participate in some of the, uh, the activities. Next slide. So just quickly, you know, we have developed a strategic plan, um, 2021 to 2030. We will be launching this strategic plan at the um, African uh, Protected Areas Congress that will be held in Kigali uh, from the 18th. Um, and in that strategic plan, we have our vision, our mission, and you know, the focus areas, the, the three main focus areas, influencing uh, policy frameworks, capacity strengthening uh, of the members and mobilizing financial resources. Next slide, please. Um, what we, in terms of the, 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 the membership profile is that we find that our members are engaged in a range of uh, uh, initiatives, which include research, they include uh, training um, and also community development. So, there are some members on the ground research. And I think that, you know, this is the point I was making about the diversity of, of the ACMA members. So we have members that are also operating at the national level. And, and this is important because operating at the national level, you are able to, to support local actors and also to support governments. Because when we look at issues of uh, the CBD, the, the parties, to the, to the CB, CBD convention are the ones that actually sign and have legal obligations to implement this. As civil society organizations, we're there to support 
uh, the governments to achieve this. And of course, leading up before they sign, we try to influence them. And, and we try to ensure that the things that are important and, uh, and critical to, to local communities and IPLCs are taken on board um, and, and included in the final formulation of what is signed. Um, we've also found that the member, uh, member programs benefit between 1,000 to 15,000 households, depending on what the issues are. Next slide. This is how we are organized. Um, so we have a coordinator uh, overall um, working with the different groups. And ACBA delivers its work th through three working groups. We have a policy working group. And the policy working group looks at a lot of the, as its name implies, the policy issues, some of the technical issues, so sort of the thematic uh, and programmatic issues. We have a secretariat working group that looks at membership issues and coordinates a whole range of activities that are related to, to membership issues. So, for example, as we go to, to APAC, we have some funds to sponsor members. So, the coordination of that sponsorship and engagement and participation uh, of members at APAC will be coordinated through the Secretariat Working Group. And then the, the, the last group is the Communications Working Group, which we really feel is, is, is really vital for, for a network because the communications gives us the visibility. It gives us the opportunity to be able to communicate you know, who we are, the things that we are doing and so on. And when people need to know what ACBA is, that is the window that they go to to find out more about uh, the communications, um, about what we do. So that's a very, very important uh, uh, group uh, uh, for us. And if you want to influence, you need to be able to package your information and you need to be able to target that information to, to the right um, audience. So these groups meet during the month and then once a month, the last Thursday of the month, we have a high level meeting where all the members come together and each one of these three groups makes a presentation uh, to the high level meeting in terms of the progress of the issues. And if they need any decisions, they table those decisions at this monthly meeting for the members to endorse um, uh, those decisions. And then below are just some of our strategic you know, partners, um, the Chinese Civil Society by the uh, Alliance for Biodiversity Conservation, I've mentioned them. African Development Bank, they have a civil society unit within the bank, and we've organized quite a few webinars with the African Development Bank. They're a key partner because they, they, um, they fund uh, a lot of uh, investments uh, on the continent, especially in infrastructure, and that has impacts on biodiversity. The CBD Alliance I've mentioned, we've had dialogues with the European Union and the European Commission again, trying to influence and tr their positions on biodiversity, but also trying to understand their positions uh, around biodiversity. Uh, CLN, we've mentioned that, and then the Global Environment Facility, we've engaged with them. And um, unfortunately, we were not able to have, they had agreed to make a presentation to the ACPA members about the Global Environment Facility and how members could access those resources, but that didn't uh, happen. Next slide. I think we should be close to the end here. So in terms of the diversity, so here we are, um, just in terms of uh, the size of the budgets of these members, you see that the majority of, uh, uh, of our members are really small uh, organizations. They have small annual budgets and only 16% of budgets greater than a um, than million dollars. So it shows it's sort of the range of the size of the the financial resources that our members uh, have. Next slide. Um, in terms of the issues that they engage in, so they're involved in all this sort of the multilateral um, uh, processes, uh, climate change, uh, desertification, CITES, um, UNEA, and of course, um, uh, CBD. And uh, I guess you know it depends on uh, the focus of each one of these members in terms of um, uh, what they participate in. But you'll see here that most members participate in uh, in climate change, and and this has become very important because of the link between climate change and biodiversity. So it's really important. We can't deal with biodiversity separate to climate change and vice versa. 
And it's important that as, as ACBA, we are also engaging uh, in climate change. Next slide. Um, so where are, and this is an interesting uh, finding which, has, which emerged from the voluntary commitments actually, where are the members getting most of their funding from? So it's, it's very interesting when you look at that, the international NGOs are the main sources uh, of funding for, you know, for our members. Um, so international NGOs, international foundations, uh, equal number of members are getting funding from, uh, from those. In some countries, national governments are making funds uh, available uh, to them. But that is uh, significant, and you know we have to think of what does that mean in terms of um, the independence of uh, African civil society organizations. Next slide. I think that's it um, in terms of the sort of the background. So so thank you, and oh, so thank uh, you. really looking forward to the presentation and also the demonstration. So over. Thanks, Pauline. Thank you very much, Yemi. So again, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Cornelius Kazora uh, from Uganda. And uh, Dr. Cornelius supported, has been supporting ACBA to prepare us for this uh, voluntary contributions um, exercise. Um, he facilitated the process where we, as uh, members of ACBA um, did an analysis, an internal analysis on how we see ourselves contributing to the global biodiversity uh, framework post-2020 GBF. And Dr. Connell, so now we have gone to the next stage of where he's going to take us through, through the process of, of how they of how we can, having reviewed our own contribution to the GBF, how now we would like to uh, make these commitments as part of uh, the global um, commitments. So over to you, um, Cornelius. Yeah. Mm. Um, morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to be part of this team. And uh, I will not assume that everybody who is listening in participated in the previous exercise that my friends have referred to. So I will go slowly in a manner to allow even the new members to, to, to understand and to follow so that thereafter they can also be able to make their, their commitments. Next. Okay. So, in terms of structure of the presentation, we want to look at the, the background to the training, and then after that, we look at the mechanism for addressing global environmental problems, of which voluntary commitments are a part. Then we understand the difference between binding legal agreements and voluntary commitments. Our main focus is going to be on voluntary commitments, but it's also good to know how they differ from the binding legal agreements, which some countries sign to. We shall also look at categories of institutions that can submit voluntary commitments under the Convention of Biological Diversity. When it comes to non-state actors, we shall also find out who they are because they are also invited to submit voluntary commitments. Most importantly, given that the voluntary commitments are not binding, it is good to understand the rationale or the motivation for submitting them. But while they are not binding, we should not take it for granted and simply feel or submit. We should also be aware of the issues to avoid when submitting them. Now, we shall go through the procedures for submission. And in these procedures, we shall follow 
the CBD guidelines. Now, these CBD guidelines help all countries to have a standard way of submission so that at CBD Secretariat, they are able to aggregate and show the position. And some of these positions, uh, which I studied from the, from the online submissions, will be presented this morning. Then we need to know the contents under VC submissions and then to demonstrate how they are done. Thereafter, we shall talk about how we monitor, report, and account for voluntary submitted over time, at least up to 2030. So that is going to be the structure of the presentation. Next, please. So as the Dr. Ellen mentioned and the polling, in 2021, with support from AWF, ACUPA members who were at that time 21 compiled their voluntary commitments, which were consolidated in one report. So those ones of you who are interested can always approach the Secretariat to access this report. The objectives at that time were to demonstrate the extent and diversity of ACUPA members' programs and their contribution to nature conservation and livelihoods. And I'm very happy that the, Dr. Amy brought out some of the findings uh, when he was making uh, a presentation on ACUPA members. Second objective was to invite ACUPA members to indicate the scope of work they plan to undertake up to 2030 as a commitment to sustainable use of biodiversity and to make a map of Africa's priorities for 2020 targets, uh, post-2020 targets, and to communicate how the members' programs commitment can contribute to the post-2020 global biodiversity framework targets. So that's the work they did. Now, the map you are seeing is how we got response from civil society and non-state actors at that time. But from an independent point of view, I think now we are seeing members, more members interested also to submit, and the membership has also grown. And to the PI who had run this training earlier, the numbers of people submitting would have been much greater. But nonetheless, there is still time for members to, to submit. You can see Kenya, Kenya was really very active followed by Zimbabwe. So there are, of course, some spaces, mainly from West Africa. We hope sooner or later they will also be part of this group. Next, please. So the focus of training today is to conduct an online training for members and other CSOs interested in taking the previous process of making their voluntary commitments forward and submit them on CBD online platform. Uh, this is very important. And the main focus will be to show how to comply with guidelines for submitting voluntary commitments with the minimum changes from voluntary commitments in ACBA report. Now, this is what I want to emphasize here. Here, we are all going to follow the CBD guidelines. But the good thing for members who had already made their voluntary commitments previously, they will have very minimal change, actually, because they already know what is involved, alignment with their sustainable development goals. So they, they are already familiar with most of the things. But the desired outcome after all of this is to enable each member gain confidence, successfully submit their voluntary commitments online. Next. So, globally, there are two ways countries and the stakeholders address environmental problems. 
One of them is legal binding agreements, and the second one are voluntary commitments. Let's first understand the binding legal agreements. Now, these agreements are made by states after negotiations and put under international law. And they are a, the individual members who sign to them. Now, once a country has sent those agreements, they are required and expected to implement them in their countries. In this presentation, I'm giving two. One, Convention of Biological Diversity, which was signed in 1992 in Rio, and of late, the Paris Climate Agreement 2015. Now, these binding agreements have two main features that make them different from voluntary commitments. They have provisions for dispute resolution. In other words, if you sign to them and do not play your part, or play your part in a manner that may affect others, then people may complain to the convention and they mandate compliance. Now, I'm going to give you an example, some of you that are familiar with, uh, in this case, study of biological convention by biological diversity, under Article 27, if you have a dispute with another country, the first step is to negotiate because that is cost effective and very cheap and very fast. But should you fail to negotiate, then the next step is you go to mediation, where a third party comes to with the parties. Then should the second step fail, then you go to the third one, which is arbitration. And if arbitration fails, then you go to International Court of Justice as the last result. And uh, I'll give an example that uh, of recent some of you may have heard from America, where the states under the climate agreement, the states in America, should the, the, the federal government that it had no powers to determine their emissions and the court ruled in favor of the states. So that is a, a case that should be of interest to follow because some people, this is taking us backwards. Next. So on the other hand, voluntary commitments are distinguished from legal and binding commitments because of two main reasons. Men Members making them do not need to have consensus. In other words, you don't need to agree with your other CSO on what you're going to submit. Each member is free to submit as what is is, is via team self or negotiate them. But we shall give caveats or what people should avoid. And Therefore, voluntary commitments are not binding. They are, only, they are only voluntary. And they take on very many forms. You can have a declaration. You can have code of conduct, guidelines, how you behave among yourselves. You can have an international standard like the International Organization for Standardization, ICO 14,000, and which some organizations for certain good practices of environmental management. But importantly, and in line with the CBD guidelines, they generally should provide specific actions to be taken within a given time frame. And for our purpose, we are looking at 20 to 30, and the B show results which are measurable provide for measurable results. In other words, for clear indicators for, to be delivered by the end of the period. Next, please. 
So who is eligible to make these voluntary commitments? One, governments actually can also make voluntary commitments. But in the first instance, they are the ones supposed to make binding commitments under the CBD. But they can also make voluntary commitments. Now, other actors, players can also make voluntary commitments, but when they do, they primarily come in to complement government efforts. Because the government efforts carry the bigger weight. And these actors include non-state actors. But non-state actors are not the only ones who make voluntary commitments. So in non-state actors category, what are all those actors that are, represent, are not representatives of states or governments? They operate at the different levels, and as Ian mentioned, they can be at community level, they can be at the local government level, they can be at the national level, they can be at the regional level. But ultimately, relevant international relations when it comes to biodiversity convention. Now, according to CBD Secretariat, the following are the categories of non-state actors. One, you have the business community that includes the private and the financial sectors, for example. The second category are other organizations now, if you go online, you find there are other organizations. And in those other organizations, you have indigenous people and local communities, youth, women groups, academia, civil society organizations, non-government organizations, faith-based organizations, etc. And then your individuals making commitments, state actors that can make commitments. Next, please. Now, in as much as not binding, we should also understand why it is good to submit them or what is the rationale. The first reason that they enhance of organization making them. So Ecotrust, AWF, all those organizations that met, they enhance the reputation of the organizations into the international debate of CBD. But they also stimulate actions where negotiations will take long because these are voluntary. So you can quickly agree on an action you can take forward without having to reach consensus with all the other members. And they are flexible because they are capable of addressing the new problems quickly and where they arise. So because you don't have to negotiate them with any other person, you don't go through the rigor of meetings, conference of parties. So they have they avoid very high of negotiation. But the good thing, they also signal our society governments are supposed to act. For example, when governments are very slow to talk about it, the government will start to take lessons as to why non-state actors are also raising the issues of financing. So all in all, they do accommodate, they are very accommodative to site area-specific issues. And I've given a few examples here, indigenous people's rights and the need for greater share of financing to Africa, for example, that was a lot of biodiversity, but it is not well favored when it comes to financing. So when these debates start to come out, people start to take interest in them, and they can form part of the agenda when we hold the conference of party. Next. Why they are voluntary? Why voluntary commitments are not binding? 
there are pitfalls we should all avoid. And the, a critical one is using them for, for greenwash or window dressing. In other words, you simply try and submit voluntary commitments because you have had others are doing it when you have no commitment at all, at all, at all. So it would not be very good. It would not improve your reputation if after two, three years, people come back and ask you what you have done and you are not able to mention any progress. And the other pitfall to avoid is failing to make progress reports even when you are facing implementation challenges. So, and it is good actually when you make progress report and along, talk about challenges you are facing to implement your what? Voluntary commitments. Next, please. So, now we want to go into the commitments we are going to make and to give the context how they came about. In the conference of parties in 2018 in Egypt, the governments of China and Egypt, with the Secretary of CBD, launched what they called the Sham El Sheikh to Coming Action Agenda for Nature and People. I think coming has changed now that we are likely to go to Canada. But at least the irritation still remains the same, even if the things change. The above action agenda aimed at enhancing the role of non state actors in the CBD, in addition to governments, in what is referred to as the World Society approach. A world society approach that brings governments, business, private sector, CSOs, NGOs, individuals. In other words, for post 2020 CBD framework, we want everybody to get involved. Now, the world society approach was affirmed by CBD's open ended working group, to which some of you have been very active and are still active that prepares and updates the post-2020 global budget. So for the future, we cannot afford to lose them. We'd rather even get more of them participating. Next. So, the action agenda for voluntary commitment starts the objectives. A key one is to raise public awareness about the urgent need to hold biodiversity loss because we are not yet there and restore the health of ecosystems on which all of us depend. And share these practices and actions that could inspire and support the implementation of nature based solutions to meet the global challenges, including climate change. The linkage between biodiversity and climate change is so close that actually most countries are taking these things in parallel and in an integrated manner. And thirdly, to catalyze cooperative initiatives in support of global biodiversity goals. Now, the action agenda is hosted on an online platform and the and we receive and show commitments and contributions to biodiversity. So if you open there, you will see the commitments of, of organizations, of governments, of individuals, all summarized there. Next. So the CBD Secretariat has provided guidelines on procedures or not submit voluntary commitments by non-state actors and even other players. So voluntary commitments of non-state actors would continue, would continue to be submitted on a voluntary basis using a and 
that commitment I've already talked about in order to facilitate aggregation of submissions. So you can total every time they update them, you will know how many submissions have been made by non-state actors, by individuals, by private sector, and in what themes and what the sustainable domain goals are recovered. So it helps to aggregate and to know the global commitments in a summary. So the CBD secretary held all the register of commitments um, of non-state actors, indigenous people, and local communities, and continues to update them. And uh, once in a while, once you go in, you will see all is the updates. Next. Now, I'm giving this summary, for example, actions per region as of 20th June when I accessed the, 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 the web. And you will notice in that presentation, what 507 actions to note is that Asia and Pacific were leading followed by Europe. Now, you can see Africa were still back of that. We are well, not as strong in terms of numbers of people and uh, submissions by region. Next. When it comes to commitments by action, there are 11, 11 Cornelius, we cannot hear you. Well, I can't hear you. I don't know about the others. Can you hear us? I, we lost connectivity and then I, I, sorry about that. Can you hear us now? Jamban gives me, give me a thumbs up if you can. Oh yes, Paulina, I can yeah. hear Okay, fine. This guy can continue? Okay. So as I was mentioning, you can see that the consultation and restoration of ecosystems was taking an upper hand as at that time. Next. Slide, please. Now, actions by sector. Um, you also notice that the, the bigger number is by the private sector. And the followed by non-government organizations. And the indigenous people and local communities are not as many. And the academia and the research institutes are doing well. And the, we think in the, going forward, they will do better. The youth are not yet doing well. I think it could be because of the way they are organized or poor organized. So, this was the status as at that time. Next. So, the CBD Secretariat has guidelines for submission. And the list there which is given is actually is what is followed. 
and it is the one which we want to go through. Name of the organization, for those who have the website and the logo, you put in, but it's good that everybody puts in the country, the type of organization. Now, you have the name of commitment, description of commitment, action themes, geographical areas, Aishi by diversity targets, sustainable development goals, contact person, and the contact email. Now, what is very clear there is that the items mentioned in blue are the ones which is going to take much of our time now because your name of the organization, the logo, the country, those ones, you know, and the person who represents the organization, that's straightforward. So in the next three slides, the same requirements are shown in procedure for filling and submitting the voluntary commitments. But what I want to emphasize now is that when it comes to some of the guidelines, like filling action scenes, geographical areas, each by diversity targets, sustainable development goals, you have a drop box. So once you have made a commitment, you now relate it to the action seems to which they relates in a very logical order, and you don't simply feel it when things may not be related. So in as much as they are online, we're also going to show them here so that as part of this presentation, even before members go online, they know what those things uh, are covering. So next, please. So, so when you go to online, that the address of the online form you feel. All voluntary commitments are submitted online at that website. You click and you go through the procedure and it's submit. So what we are doing now is to repeat the same procedure that is online. So as soon as you open, you will get out the platform that has four categories of stakeholders. You have the private sector and the business, other organizations and the individual. Now, for most of the ACUBA members, you're fully in the in the can you come out here? In other organizations, yeah, go behind, go behind. behind. You're for in other organizations. So in our case, we shall click on other organizations. And this category is for non-government organizations, academia, and other organizations that were mentioned previously. So they are not that column is not for other people like the business people, the government, or individuals. So ours is a third color space. Next. So name of organization. So that's the second page that comes out. Name of organization, the website, the logo, if you have the logo, the country, the country has a drop box for all the countries in the world. So you click and you get your country filled. Uh, and the type of the organizations, and then below you get to the commitment, the name and the description. So we're going to show you how you can write your commitment early and describe it, and then maybe just add the file, or you can feed it directly if you, if you want. But that's one of the demonstrations we want to, to provide this morning. Next, please. So commitment linkages. When it comes to action scenes, action scenes are 11, 
Then the geographical areas are classified according to the old group, and as I showed you in the previous example, the age by diversity targets 20, and the sustainable development goals 17. So these ones we are going to repeat. So you choose where your commitment relates in terms of action areas, Aishi by diversity targets and SDGs or sustainable development goals. And after that, you put there your name and your email address. And below on the right, you see submit. And once you submit, and so you are ready to verify, you submit your online submission will go to the registry to join other submissions in the registry. Next. So here we repeat what you'll find under the space of action scenes. They are 11, access and benefit sharing, by the safety, climate change mitigation and adaptation, four is conservation and restoration of land ecosystems, conservation and sustainable use of species, food systems and health as number six, seven is fresh water, coastal and ocean ecosystems, eight is green finance, nine is stewardship, 10 is sustainable consumption and production, and living is urban sustainability. So there are only 11 action scenes under which you should relate your voluntary commitments. Next. The geographical areas are already given. If you are operating in all of Africa, you then you tick all Africa. If you are in East Africa, you tick the relevant. But these are the, the, the drop-down options for Africa where we belong. Yeah. So the age by the university targets are 20. In the first slide, we have given the first 10 on awareness of biodiversity, integration of biodiversity values as number two. Three are incentives. Four is use of natural resources. Five is loss of habitats. Six is sustainable fisheries. Seven is area under sustainable management. Eight is pollution. Nine is invasive alien species. And 10 is vulnerable ecosystems. But there are 20. Then 11, you have protected areas. Toro is preventing extinction. 13, agricultural biodiversity. 14, essential ecosystem services. 15, is ecosystem resilience. 16, is Nagoya protocol on ABC access and benefit sharing. And then 17, is on national biodiversity strategy and action plans. 18, is on traditional knowledge. 19, is biodiversity knowledge. And the Twitter is a source what? Mobilization. So for CSOs and members who are in resource mobilization, when it comes to IT biodiversity targets, you can see you fall in. Yeah. So the 17 sustainable development goals are well known, and it is good to align your your voluntary commitments to the relevant, the immediately relevant. Sustainable development to go to which the rates. Uh, one being no poverty, two, zero hunger, three, good health and well being, four, quality education, five, gender equality, six, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy as number seven, eight, is decent work and economic growth, nine, is industry innovation and infrastructure and 10 is reduced inequality. Then you have 11. Next. 11 sustainable cities and communities. 12, responsible consumption and production. 13, climate action. 14, light, low water. 
15 life on land, 16 peace and justice storm institutions, 17 partnerships to achieve the goal. Here I should mention that it is good to really relate the sustainable goal, development goals to your commitments and not to, to feel too many because it is very easy to see, but at least to know that if I'm to report to other members, this is why I should have be, be seen to have made a very big contribution because most of my planned actions are actually going to fall under that sustainable development goal. So next. So before you submit the effort, it's advisable to try and open the online tool and familiarize oneself before submitting. You gain confidence, you see the themes, you actually repeat what we have shown. But importantly, get the information ready in advance before going to online uh, platform. For some of the members, I will give an example. You may already have what you call organizational strategies or strategic plans. And you may want to relate your voluntary commitments to the actions you have already planned and your strategic plans. So you may want to see it in-house and say which of your planned actions and your strategies you want to communicate to the rest of the world as your voluntary commitment. So it is very good that you take off time to plan and see where you as an organization you want to be visible in the international arena when it comes to your voluntary commitment submission. So it is good to take time not to be mechanical because the online tool can make you behave mechanically after all it is easy to see and submit. Yeah, next. So we need to know what happens after submitting. So broadly, we want nine state actors after submission after to implement their commitments while keeping the records of their achievements. And uh, so that when it comes to giving the feedback to other members or in the alliance, you can be able to have something of good practice to share. Next. Next. So how are the voluntary commitments monitored? Now, this is very interesting. Although many non-state actors already have monitoring and reporting mechanisms within the way they operate and a lot of data, Future recording of non-state actors by diverse actions must build on the existing data providers to avoid duplication and to streamline accountability mechanisms. So the non-state actors will have to be willing to align their existing reporting to a global biodiversity framework on feature goals, targets, and indicators with the review mechanism for set actions. Now, some of you may have seen how the goals, targets, and indicators are being structured under the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. And they, they will not differ very much from the IH targets, but what is important is that it will be very good to know that framework of monitoring and evaluation so that when you report some of your indicators can be able to be aggregated with other members to see what you are achieving at the end of each period. Next, please. Next. Who should hold non status accountable? One who have already known that these are voluntary, non binding. Today, it is clear and clear who has the mandate, capacity, and knowledge to monitor non state actors' actions, let alone to put them accountable. Because they are everywhere, everybody uh, in space. So, 
there is no institutionalized mechanism. But in the meantime, it would be good that the United States actors align their monitoring and reporting frameworks with the national reporting requirements and timelines, because that means we have the commitment and obligation to submit their, their performance when they communicate to the CBD Secretariat. So when you align yourself with government, then your governments can take on and reflect some of your contributions that, that you are making in the national reports. That's what I really wanted to emphasize. So national reports today will be the main instruments for reporting and reviewing mechanism under the convention of the protocols. The others will be secondary, but the, the national reports will be the main ones. And it will be very good that CSOs, non-government organizations, non-state actors align themselves to these reports. Next, please. Next, the next, yeah, but this one is the, it's mainly aligning to national reports. So, as you mentioned in the beginning, the Secretariat of Akuba, uh, that's the Akuba actually, could also periodically say that after every three years, members share information, one, how they are progressing on implementing their voluntary work commitments, so that we don't submit and go to sleep. And then also to report on what indicators you are achieving, show progress, and where members can have some of the indicators aggregated, then we aggregate them and show what you have been able to deliver. Three, the same reporting could show what support you have received and from who. Then we can also be able to update where the CSOs or non-state actors are actually getting the support. And the final, but not the least, what constraints, if any, you are facing. Uh, so that then we can be able to document that when it comes to African non-state actors, this content seems to be frustrating them in meeting their voluntary what? Commitments. Now, we are going to show two cases here. One of them is of environmental conservation trust of Uganda. And the, as I mentioned, when you go to the online tool, the other spaces are very easy to feed because the name of the organization, the country in which is born, the, the representative of the organization, and the contact of the person within the organization. Now, these ones, I have brought them out very strongly to show that this is where you are going to need a lot of effort to think through and say how your voluntary commitment statement relates to the subsequent uh, other items online. Now, from the previous study and uh, looking into the future, based on the EcoTrust strategic plan, they intend as their voluntary commitment to mobilize United States dollars 100 million in foreign direct investment for smallholder lake forest rate investments, number one, establishing private forest reserves, two, conserving protected areas, four, and implementing other effective conservation measures using that amount of money mobilized. That's their voluntary commitment. Now, and that's a very, very, very ambitious commitment, but it's very good that if we see some of the non-state actors going all the way to raise this type of money for those type of activities, then people in the world should be able to say, no, I think we need to support these constituents of players so that they can help us to, to reach our targets much faster. So when it comes to description, very briefly, Ecotrust wants to oblige that amount of money, again, for smallholder forest investments, covering 
covering 6,000 hectares. I, uh, here I want to emphasize the element of measurable output, 6,000 hectares. Then establishing five, five private reserves. I'm still emphasizing the element of indicator five. Mobilizing communities to conserve 10, 10 protected areas and to implement other effective conservation measures. So you see in their description, they are coming out very strongly to talk about their measurable outputs by which they want to be held accountable uh, by 2030, by 2030. So when you look above, you will see that Ecotrust in terms of action seems it is going to be very strong on action three, on climate change, mitigation, and adaptation. Then it is also going to be strong on conservation and restoration of land ecosystems. And it's going to be very strong on green finance. Those come out very strongly from the voluntary commitment statement and the description. Geographical end of ecotrust is this target. Now, the Aichiba University targets that directly relates to its voluntary commitment are three, seven areas under sustainable management, two, target 11 on protected areas, three, target 20 on resource mobilization. And the immediate sustainable development goals to which they relate are the two, climate action, life on land. But of course, they will have other SDGs, but these are so direct that it would not be good for Ecotrust to report on other marginal SDGs when these ones are very strong from its voluntary commitment and the description of its activities. So these ones come out very, very, very strongly. So the second case we want to share with you is from Namibia Association of Community-Based Natural Resource Management Support Organization. Uh, and this is based on the previous study also. Its voluntary commitment was to increase black rhino population by 5% in the next 10 years. And uh, in terms of description, it had stated that the biodiversity conservation through protection of habitats, with the aim to have black rhino population increased by 5% by 2030. But what is important also in this case is the element of measurable output. Yeah. Then action themes, now you will see also that the, it is strong in the theme of conservation and restoration of land ecosystems. And number five, action five in the conservation and sustainable use of species. Because it's so direct when it comes to the black rhino. So you see, when it comes to the Namibia Association of Community Based Natural Resources, it is really having a very good action on species. Now, the member comes from Africa, from Southern Africa, South African Development Community. And the, when it comes to relating its voluntary commitment to by biodiversity targets, you see it is strong on protected areas and number two on preventing extinction of the black rhino. Now, its immediate sustainable development goes to which there is, is like on what? On land. So, in other words, members who feel or participated in the previous study already have something to begin with. The only new addition we can say is that they can update them based on what has happened since then. But number two, to say, how some of them relate to what they have planned under their uh, strategic plans or organizational strategies and plans. So that then they, they do things or they communicate voluntary commitments that they will closely 
do, but not simply have theory for online. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Cornelius. And uh, we are now going to have Sui. Sui, if you can share, we are going to have Sui filling in um, filling in the the commitments that uh, Cornelius has been uh, talking about. So over to you, Sui, if you could share your screen and then go to are you able to share Sui? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can all see my screen and hear me clearly. So I'm just going to be putting in the information from the Equitrust slide, which Cornelia has just shared, um, just to show what it looks like in practice. Um, yeah, so we're going to start with the general information. The name of the organization is Ecotrust Uganda. Our website is ecotrust.or.ug. And then for the logo, I'm going to just add a file. Um, add a file from, from the computer. Okay. All right, so that's added. And then there's a drop down for the countries. So you just select what country the organization is from. Or oh, is this from Uganda? ST Uganda. There we are. And then the type of the organization, which is an NGO. Our commitment, so this is where it's important to have organized your information ahead of time. So you can have agreed on what you're committing to and just copy it from wherever you made the arrangements into the form. So the name of the commitment is that long sentence, mobilization of 100 million in FDI for ETC, what was in the slide. And then for the description, um, we have the same description that was in the slide. We just paste it. Um, and then this attachment is if you have a supporting documentation to your commitment, you could add a link to it or add a file. Um, just the same way, the same way you would add a link up at the logo place, the same way you do it down here. Um, action themes. We agree that we are under action themes three, four, and eight. So I'll just select those. So action themes three, which is climate change. So we select climate change. And then we have conservation and restoration of land ecosystems. It's right there. And then lastly, we have green finance, um, which is over there. Then geographic areas, we are operating East Africa. So just select that. Then our IHE biodiversity targets, we have um, sustainable management, areas under sustainable management, which is seven. Then we have 11 protected areas. And 20, which is resource mobilization. And then the sustainable development goals, we had 13 and 15, climate action and life on land. So I'll just select those. Um, climate action, and we also have life on land. You put in the name of your contact person and then their email address. And once you've done that, then you're ready to submit. There we go. 
And then once you put in the email address, Mm -hmm. I like that. And then we should be good to go. So yeah, that should be all. And then once once you're ready, you submit. Would you like to submit or to just stop there? Should I just stop there? Yeah, <laughs> it's it's now? Submit. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think uh, maybe so we can just stop there because she may want to review her things before she submits. She may want to add um, like there is a, a, a optional information down yeah. and, and so on and so forth. But yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Cornelius. Um, uh, Jamban, um, Yemi, Jamban, and uh, uh, Olivia. I don't know whether you've got any any information in the in the chat that you would like us to respond to. If people have submitted questions in their Q and A, um, I for me the all the all the comments that I saw were comments that were thanking Cornelius for the clarity in the presentation. Uh, there was Maxi and, and, and other people, but I also would like to thank Maxi because Na Maxi is from Naxo. So very good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I would like to thank Maxi and all the other people that provided the information that has enabled um, that has enabled the present. I mean, the, the capacity building to to take place. But Jamban, Yemi, Olivia, I don't know whether we had any any comments, questions that you saw that you would like to, to highlight. But people can, maybe people were giving a lot of attention, were paying a lot of attention and they were not able to chat. But for me, the comments I've seen are mainly those ones that have been thanking Cornelius for the clarity of, um, of the presentation. Jamvan, um, Olivia. Um, hi, Pauline. Um, on my side, I, I also cannot see any question from the chat box, but I think this is the time also that we can uh, request uh, the uh, panel, the attendees, uh, in case they want, they have any questions, uh, they can put it on the Q&A and uh, we can pick it up. But so far, we don't have any questions, just comments of uh, from the presentation that we've had. Jamban, would you like to, I don't know whether you have made any observations, but otherwise I will give, I will give uh, an opportunity to, to Maxi. I will request you, um, Jamban, to just give Maxi to, to probably put some voice on the comments she put on chat, but also on, on how now she feels maybe the state of readiness to, to fill in after having gone through the other process that enabled us to at least have some thought about um, what um, um, what 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 give give us some thought on what we would like to commit, and then this other one that is to us that filled in the other one, which is now seeming uh, very easy. But there is a a question from David Bio. And uh, he's asking, what's the nexus between the voluntary commitments and 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 NB sub? Cornelius, maybe you can go ahead and and respond to that. NB sub are not voluntary. Those are commitments under uh, binding agreement by the governments. Those have to be submitted every other years and uh, they, are, they show the obligations that the government signed to and what they are able to achieve. Now, when they are submitting those uh, NSAB as governments, because they are also showing what they have achieved, this is where non-state actors can also include what they have been able to deliver 
as partners to their governments in terms of fulfilling their uh, voluntary commitments. And that's why when we said when it comes to reporting, we said it is very good that when it comes to non-state actors reporting, we are aligning our reporting to our national governments, and then our submission becomes part of the report they make. Okay. Thank you very much. We have two related questions that, Yemi, if you're there, I would like you to respond to them. One of them is uh, how to join. There is uh, someone from, um, uh, from DRC uh, requesting their youth uh, organization, how they can join. But also we have someone from an already youth organization member, uh, Hassan. And Hassan is, is, is wondering, uh, we need financial support to implement our voluntary contributions. How can we solve this? Uh, Dr. Yemi, I would like to request you to respond, respond to that, but also maybe then we will come back to, oh, oh Dr. Yemi, as you're thinking about that, there's another question that is coming from uh, Sierra Leone, Bintu, and, uh, and uh, Bintu is, is, is requesting how can individuals who make voluntary contributions be monitored since it is non-binding. I think that Cornelius, you already said that, yeah. but it would be nice to, to, um, to elaborate some more since that has, since that has been um, <laughs> this thing. I'm, I'm sorry, Maxi, I put you on the spot, but um, um, after uh, uh, Yemi has responded, we'll start with Cornelius straight away talking about uh, the monitoring, and then we'll have Yemi reminding people how to join, but also make some comments on, on, on the financing of this, then we, then we will have Maxi uh, give some feedback on how you have found this as a person who had already uh, thought about uh, how the voluntary contributions can be made. So over to you, Cornelius. Yes, thanks. Uh, and uh, a friend from Sierra Leone, thanks a lot. I, I, I would like to repeat, and it does not only apply to individuals. To date, there is no institution that is going to be directly responsible for holding non-state actors accountable for what they submit. But in good spirit, and in terms of you not simply feeding a voluntary commitment simply because maybe you want money or you want some support, it is important to keep abreast of how your country to which you belong is also progressing when it comes to meeting its obligations. As I mentioned, it's governments, it states it's governments that have what you call legal commitments to submit reports. And on our part, from the private sector, from non-government organizations, from individuals, if we're interested in what the government is doing and the space it occupies in the reporting, we should, as much as possible, bring our submissions along or within the reports they, they submit to the Secretariat of the Convention of Biological Diversity so that they are reflected. You will not find it easy to submit on your own. Uh, it will not be visible. So I still want to emphasize all CSOs, all individuals who want to submit voluntary commitments, to take interest in what is happening around them from the, those institutions or governments that have an obligation to make periodic reports. And then we were on voluntary commitments to align our submissions with those people who have obligations to deliver. Yemi, thank you, Cornelius. So thanks, Pauline. I, I will let I will answer the the question about um, funding uh, for voluntary commitments, and I will let Jan Van um, speak to the issue of how to, how far to become a member because you know he handles that, and so he can give very practical uh, information. So the issue of how to get 
um, financial support to implement voluntary commitments. I think the starting point is that you shouldn't see voluntary commitments as something separate to what your organization does. And it's important that your voluntary commitments are part of your, your strategic plan or your overall plans in terms of um, your, your, your vision and your mission of what you're trying to do. Um, what voluntary commitments uh, do is that they demonstrate that your organization has a commitment to make a contribution to um, reversing biodiversity loss. And by entering your voluntary commitments uh, on, on this platform, you're making a statement. You're raising your profile and you are raising your, your, the hand of your organization that we have a commitment. We, as an organization, we are raising our hand. We want to make this contribution. And these are the voluntary you know, commitments that we want to make. So in itself, does not guarantee that you get money, but by not doing it, you're not visible. So one of the things that we've, we've said is one of the benefits of voluntary commitments is, is that it raises the profile of, of the organization, but even the profile of Akbar uh, as a network, we are actually able to say, here is a network that is committed to biodiversity conservation and sustainable use. And this is what the members are saying in terms of that commitment. They are stepping up and this is what they're saying. Now, for instance, we are in discussions with uh, USAID in terms of how they can support uh, ACBA. And one of the things that we are saying is that our members are, have demonstrated a commitment to addressing the biodiversity crisis by indicating their voluntary commitments. Now, if we can now say these commitments have been uploaded onto the CBD secretariat platform, I mean, that is even more powerful. I mean, that is evidence that we know we're not just talking, but we've actually put it within a platform on one of the on one of the conventions. And we are then able to use that also as the basis to to leverage. We are also able to make the argument that when we undertook the exercise of determining the voluntary contributions of our members, one of the constraints that was identified is lack of funding. Um, and so as a network, we, um, we are willing to support uh, the members in, in order to leverage additional uh, funds, but we also believe that these voluntary commitments should be part and parcel of your organizational program and, and therefore part of your overall organizational uh, fundraising strategy, not something on the side, but for sure, it does enhance the possibility of raising funds. And we certainly as a network want to use that as also the basis to demonstrate the commitment of our members. And the fact that our members have said the biggest constraint for them to implement those voluntary commitments is lack of funding. And therefore we are approaching these funders to say, we would like you to help Agba and its members in order for them to be able to implement these voluntary commitments. So there is no easy uh, solution. I think it's, um, it creates an opportunity for sure. Um, and that the network is already exploring that opportunity. Um, we, we are talking to USAID uh, about that and we, we will be meeting with USAID uh, at APAC. Uh, uh, in a working meeting, and we will invite members that are available to participate in that meeting. But we've also submitted a proposal to, to BMZ in terms of supporting the capacity of members to implement their programs. And I think that an exercise like this helps to strengthen the case to demonstrate the commitment of members. Over. So very quickly, Jamban, uh, you respond to those that uh, request to how people can join, and then we get Maxine. Um, so thank you, Pauline, and thanks for using Naxo as a as an example in terms of the training. Uh, when I uh, thanks for Cornelius for 
explaining when we um, when we actually joined um, and we populated um, to be part of, of, of the voluntary commitments, uh, we were very skeptical at the time and uh, not sure exactly what we are letting ourselves into. But I think when I saw the presentation today, um, Cornelius, for me, it was an indication that um, this is something that is doable um, anywhere um, in Africa, especially from a non-state actor's point of view. This particular landscape that we have chosen, um, it, it was a discussion first because we, I needed to, to have an agreement from all the, the, the players on that landscape because it's not, it's not just one non-governmental organization or one uh, IPLC, it was a lot of players. And once we had that commitment, um, we, we discussed it and we felt um, uh, doing it through ACBA was actually more useful because it monitors, uh, but it also shows us exactly what is the contribution that we are making, but also trying to do it within a larger framework, which is an African framework. What, what is normally happening is that we share a lot of this information, and especially when it comes to a protected species such as the black rhino, very much to our donors, and that's it. So for us, it was quite important to see what is the contribution that we would like to make uh, as, as uh, non-state actors in this part of the world, but also contributing to what is being set up by ACPA and showing what we are doing um, in, in the whole of Africa with other non-state actors. So we are under pressure in terms of the 5%. When I saw the 5%, it actually reminded me that we are working with our national, uh, with the government, to try and get more land in terms of rangeland for, for black rhinos. And we need to sign what we call uh, custodian programs. And this is something that I think uh, we need to continue doing and then populate as we go. I agree with, with uh, Yemi that we need to integrate this as part of the work that we are doing. There's not funds out there at the moment saying, you know, we can do this. I, 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 I pity the youth because we really need to support the youth in terms of the programs out there. But um, we are lucky that we have integrated this as part of our monitoring systems. We have uh, indigenous people, we have everybody that is participating as part of that landscape. And that's why we actually chose an existing landscape because that will help us and inform us to be able to influence what is happened, uh, to influence anybody else to take part as part of the program. My question is maybe, um, to Cornelius is that can one, um, what is the cap in terms of how many you can register from a country? Um, then secondly, can there be overlaps? For instance, in the Namibian uh, case, we took rhinos, but there could be another landscape that is sea, for instance, that is not on a terrestrial uh, area uh, because some of our projects also border the sea, for instance, and how do we actually address that? So, and, and it over, overlaps with some of the work that we are doing. So that is probably my question, but I think, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good, it's, it's really good that we are taking part and thanks for this uh, training. I think we should do more of this. Uh, it should be something that we not, we just, we just need to also take it uh, to our members. I think we, we are doing it now for, for our members, ACPA members, but I think we should involve everybody else in Africa to be part of this, because that will actually collect more data in showing that there's a lot that we are doing on the ground as non-state act actors. Uh, thank you, Pauline. Thank you very much, uh, Maxi. Uh, thank you very much. It's very good feedback on, on how the training has, has gone. And uh, we you have left a question, but also there are two other questions in the chat which I'm going to request uh, Cornelius to respond to. Then I'll hand it over to Yemi to say uh, the closing remarks. And I think in some of those closing remarks, Yemi will also be um, even commenting on some of the things that Maxi has alluded to, like the final question of, uh, can we take this beyond uh, ACBA membership? Um, and I think we made the invitation for all Africa best uh, partners to participate, but but Yemi will uh, will 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 also include that in as part of the uh, closing remarks. So the, the you, Cornelius, you had the questions that uh, 
that Maxi uh, raised, but also there are two other questions in the chat. Can state institutions make voluntary cost contributions? And, and, and that is still from Bin to Sierra Leone. But then there's also Isaiah who is, who is asking, if you don't have an organization, what do you do? If you don't have an organization through which you can submit your voluntary contributions. So Cornelius will respond to the comments, to the questions that uh, Maxi left on the table as she was leaving. You will also respond to those two questions, and then we will bring in Yemi, who will uh, give the concluding remarks. Over to you, um, Cornelius. Uh, thanks, thanks, Cody. First of all, there is no cap on the number of commitments you have to make. So you can make more than one commitment. That's number one. Number two, once you have submitted the commitments, it's and in the future, you, you think you should revise your commitments based on the opportunities you are able to tap, you can still make another commitment because the register for receiving uh, commitments is going to remain live. So even in the future, you can still continue to make what? Uh, commitments. Now, when it comes to state actors and the institutions submitting commitments. As I mentioned, all governments, all states have what you call the binding commitments, the legal binding commitments to make commitments as governments who have signed the convention. But number two, beyond those compulsory ones, governments also can make non-voluntary commitments. So for them, they have the bigger part, which is the binding. But beyond the binding, they can also make voluntary commitments. And in here, the other government institutions also, if they want to make voluntary commitments, can also make voluntary commitments. But when it comes to reporting in terms of country obligations, the country obligations are usually built on state or government submissions. Other players are only complementing government commitments. And the, I will tell you a dimension which I didn't mention. You will notice that from all these multilateral environmental agreements, in as much as governments have the obligations to meet their commitments, there are also benefits they get because they are signatories to those mandatory commitments or obligations. I'll give an example. You will not get a line of funding for biodiversity conservation as a government from global environmental facility unless you, as a government, you are a signatory to the Convention of Biological Work, Diversity. So there is a benefit. Governments also derive by being signatories to the binding uh, uh, agreements, because then they can become entitled to, to accessing resources for the commitments they have made from the international community. Um, before before Yemi comes in, there was still an unanswered uh, statement before, although uh, Jamban had put the guidelines in the chat. Okay on how to join, but Jamban, please, you could read out what you put in the chat, or you have, you could explain a bit more on what you put on the chat, as we wait for Yemi to, to as you will be, as, as Yemi uh, comes in to make the concluding remarks. So yes, Max, uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> Jamban, over to you. Max's name is on my tongue. <laughs> um, thank you, Pauline. I think Max really gave a good, um, overview and the uh, detail in terms of how they submitted their voluntary commitment. And thanks a lot for, for this. It actually shows how ACBA mobilizes the strengths of its diverse membership um, to work in a strategic and efficient ways. And it also enables us as an alliance to speak and act collaboratively in an inclusive manner. And uh, as one of the participants had uh, requested, um, we've uh, shared the um, the guidelines of how to join and uh, become an ACBA member. So I've just put in the chat box there. It's 
it's a it's a it's it's a simple process. Um, as Yemi was giving a background, um, Akbar has more than eighty um, NGOs across Africa, um, but we have uh, um, um, under representation in North Africa. Uh, but we, as we grow, we'll also increase our representation in North Africa and the islands. Um, there are more than 40 active members um, who engage um, on a monthly basis in the ACBA processes. And with that, um, to become an ACBA member, there's a link that I've put on the chat box. There are some guidelines there that you can just go through. It's a simple process that you go through and uh, um, and key in your details. And then thereafter, once you've done and submitted the, the, the form, um, please reach out to us um, through writing, whereby we'll advise on the next steps, um, which includes um, onboarding and also the induction process, where you'll be able to meet the ACBA coordinator, um, Dr. Yemi Katerere, um, to give you an overview um, of uh, what the alliance is and uh, what uh, working group that uh, you'll be able to join. So we have three working groups, um, the secretariat, the communications and the policy working group. So with that, I've put my email there. It's jcombo at uh, awf.org um, um, for you to write to us so that we can uh, advise on the next steps. But the first step is to just um, fill the form, share your details, and then thereafter send us an email. We'll be really glad to have you on board as a, 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 in the Alliance because together um, we can be able to influence um, and speak in one voice. And uh, that will be showcased in the Africa Protected Area Congress, which will be taking place in Kigali um, next month from the 16th to the 23rd of July. So if you also want to register for that, um, our communications team led by Olivia will also be able to share the, the registration links on the chat box um, so that you can um, you can also take part in the process. I think that's it from my end, Pauline. And thanks a lot for facilitating and coordinating the meeting. Thank you very much, Jamvan. And uh, this 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 uh, capacity building has been recorded and shared on our social media handles. So, Olivia, maybe you could share those social media links and handles for people to be able to to see because people are requesting for the presentations, copies of the presentations and so on and, and, and so forth. Over to you, Dr. Yemi, to uh, say the closing remarks. No, thanks so much, um, Pauline. So I think firstly, just to acknowledge um, Cornelius, um, the members who participated in the survey too, and also to acknowledge the others that joined this particular uh, webinar. Um, and for me, although I've been involved and worked closely with uh, Cornelius and Pauline, it was also very informative to listen to, uh, to the presentation. So thanks to everybody, you know, that made this happen. You know, one of the most striking things for me at the open-ended working group, uh, both open-ended working group three, which I participated in, and open-ended working group four in Nairobi, is how the language has changed that um, indigenous people, local communities, um, the youth, women, marginalized groups more broadly are being embraced by everybody in the negotiations. Some years ago, this would have been unheard of. Nobody wanted you know, indigenous people, local communities and so forth to be party to these negotiations. But what is, what is emerging in these uh, open-ended working group negotiations is this all of what Cornelius referred to, all of society approach. That there is no way that we can address the biodiversity and the climate change emergencies independent of each other and without the in involvement of everybody. And the acknowledgement that today we have biodiversity to talk about it's because of the efforts of indigenous people, local communities, uh, women, youth, and that all these different stakeholder groups are important. They are key, key players, they're actors that need to be embraced, that have a contribution to make as we move forward. So that is a huge opportunity. The language that governments are willing to accept, reference to the rights of indigenous people and local communities to protect those rights, to recognize the territories of local communities and indigenous uh, people is so powerful. 
And so that's a massive opportunity moving forward in terms of the role and contribution of non-state actors in the biodiversity space is it's massive. So I think that that is really great and we should, we should move into that space. We should amplify our voice. But more importantly, I think is to be able to demonstrate that we are serious players and that this is the role that we can play. And I, and I believe that the voluntary commitments is one way that we can do that. The negotiations are also saying that, yes, you know, we're talking about the NBSAPs and so forth and the reporting that the governments have to make, that they are obligated to make, that those reports to avoid double accounting should actually capture not just what the government is doing, but also what civil society organizations are doing as part of the government's report. So having a section on what the youth are doing, what you know, civil society organizations are doing, the private sector and so on and so on, actually included as part of that, of, of that report. But the point that Cornelius also made about financial resources, there are many multilateral funding sources that go to the government, through the government. And I think that as we demonstrate our capability and our commitment to contribute to biodiversity conservation and its sustainable use, we can also begin to access those funds and the government begins to see us as partners and they actually make some of those funds available uh, because there's no way government can do all these things on their own. And it is important that they also engage with the non-state actors. And I believe that we could also access some of the resources by engaging with the government and by demonstrating you know, how serious we are. I mean, the GEF, um, and thanks Cornelius for raising that, it is the largest funder to the convention of biological diversity. But there are also concerns about how the GEF operates. And in the negotiations, the parties are saying we need other funds. We can't just have the GEF. Um, and people see that the GEF um, has not played the role that it should have played and that the reasons we did not achieve the IG targets is because of lack of funding and the means of implementation. And if the post 2020 global biodiversity framework is going to be successful, then there have to be resources that match the ambition level that is being negotiated. So there is a, there is a potential. Uh, and one of, the argument, one of the languages that is coming out of those negotiations is that it's not just about the amount of money, but it's also that this money should also be accessible to non-state actors, whether it's indigenous people, local communities, and so on, that those resources need to filter down to where the action is taking place, where conservation is taking place, where the local communities, and in particular, given the African context where significant biodiversity is outside of you know, the state uh, controlled protected areas. So there are huge opportunities there. So coming back to Hassan's question about, you know, about funding. So it's interesting that even in the negotiations, there is this acknowledgement that money needs to go down to the local level. And civil society organizations have been advocating for that and lobbying for that. And it's getting into the text. So that's really important. So looking forward, I'm very optimistic and I'm, I'm really glad that um, the members have stepped up and that we should not um, restrict these voluntary commitments to the membership. I think we should open this up if there are other non-state actors that would like uh, to, to be part of this movement, they would be most welcome. And if Agba can support these other actors, um, for them to, uh, to submit their voluntary contributions, then you know, we'll be available to do that. We hope that when we get to, to COP15, that we will launch our, formally launch our voluntary commitments uh, report, but also we should be able, when we get to COP15, to be able to say that it's not just 65 voluntary commitments that were pointed out by um, Cornelius, but that we will be, 
you know, a hundred and something, we'll have as many as, as Asia or as close to, to, to Asia as, as possible. It would be good for us to be able to, you know, to demonstrate that. And we believe that through these voluntary commitments, we are raising the profile, not just of ACBA as a network that is bringing together uh, African civil society organizations, but I think also of the individual members, because I think through this, you are also making a statement about your organization and what you are willing to do. But not just what you're willing to do, but you're also demonstrating that you are in this space. You are a serious player, you're a serious actor, and you are concerned uh, about what is happening to biodiversity and that you can be a solution uh, to that particular crisis. So thank you, uh, everybody. And we look forward to taking this forward. And, and thanks very much to, to Cornelis and thanks, uh, Pauline, for uh, moderating. Over. Thank you very much, uh, Yemi. We've come to the end of, uh, of our presentation. Uh, Olivia has shared uh, how you can get in touch with us on all our social media channels. Thank you, Cornelius and Suvi, for the excellent facilitation. Jamvan, Olivia, Nirani, um, for the for the for the for putting this together. Thank you, Yemi, for the guidance that you have provided online, offline, now and before uh, the function or before the training. And I'd also like to make special mention of uh, Seth, Tommy, Hassan, I think it was Virginia from SEC or whoever the representative is, Maxi, for having been the pioneers to try out the first attempt that we made that enabled us to understand that indeed as members of ACBA, we can make significant contribution to the process that has led us to come this far to the training so that we are able to make that statement on the official website. So Seth, Tommy, Hassan, Virginia, Maxi, and all the other people that have not been able to participate today, and of course, Subi from Ecotrust, thank you very much for providing the material that has enabled this uh, training to take place. We hope that the other members, the other participants that are not from ACBA, you will join ACBA and be able to participate in other activities, but also that as um, Cornelius mentioned and as Yemi mentioned, this is not a preserve of just ACBA members. We would like all actors in all of society in Africa to be able to make their commitments so that we can also uh, fly high the African flag. Thank you very much. See you in uh, Kigali on the PAX Congress. See you on our next engagements as you follow us on our social media handles. Um, it's been a pleasure hosting and moderating uh, this event. I uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Pauline, Bye, everybody. For your leadership. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.